So here's a little appendix video, because it seems like there's some people that are really interested in the nerdy details behind the stuff. And since the big issue with the duo conversion is the logic levels and how the MOSFETs respond to different voltage inputs, I wanted to put out an excruciatingly detailed and nerdy video concerning all that stuff. So if there are any masochists out here that want to watch it all, they have a resource. So I'll hit on... Um, logic levels and their thresholds, logic level shifting, the bed MOSFETs, why they don't work or they may or may not work or kind of work at particular logic voltages, as well as external bed MOSFETs, why they work and why they might not, and some alternatives to replacing the board MOSFETs if you're going to be running something externally anyway. So here we go. So I'm going to take this as an opportunity to do a little bit of electronics 101 because people might not understand these logic levels and why they matter and what the issue is. So looking at a five volt logic level, we have five volts between, you know, your, your high voltage and your ground, and then you have thresholds that trigger either high or low. So your digital signal comes in here and ideally it should go below the low and above the high. That way it triggers in both directions just fine. Now, if we're moving from a three volt or a three volt signal to feed five volt level, usually we're going to be pretty good because those output signals are compatible. But occasionally what happens is your three volts just doesn't go high enough for the five. Now your five is usually actually 4.7 or 4.5, something like that, which means that your threshold is actually slightly lower down here. And that makes it even more compatible and you're okay. So the level we're concerned about are called V out high, V in high, and V in max. So for 3.3 volts, our output signal high is 2.4 volts. For 5 volts, that's 4.2 volts. Now if we're going to look at our V in, for 5 volts, that V in is going to be around 2 volts, which means if we are going to be sending a 2.4 volt signal from our 3.3 volt bus, we're fine. That's going to trigger, usually. Now what happens if we go the other way? Now we're gonna be talking about our V in max, specifically our V in max for 3.3 volts. So for 3.3 volts, that's going to be around 3.6 volts and that's as high as you can go before you blow things up. So if you're feeding that 4.2 volts into your 3.6, bad things happen. Now let's talk about false triggers a little bit. You've probably experienced, or maybe you've experienced this if you have goofy end stops that sometimes just trigger and stop your print. So here's our high and our low signals for three volts and five volts. And here's our signal coming in, our highs and our lows. So that's going to trigger just fine. As long as you go below that threshold, it'll you know turn it into the switched off state. However, if you have noise coming in like this, as long as it's below your threshold, you're okay. But occasionally you have really raggedy, nasty noise. And if you look at that, that's no good because it's not gonna let you trigger your low signal. Now, if you recall, I mentioned a little diode trick in another video. So what's going on there is sometimes you have these very stubborn old five volt devices that don't wanna behave. And even though that five volt is usually around 4.7 volts, Occasionally they just won't trigger. So you can add a diode in the middle that'll drop that 4.7 volts down to a little bit lower level and then it'll let it it'll trigger from 3.3 or, you know, maybe even 2.5 if you're going to 2.5 volt logic. And depending on whether you're using germanium or a, a shot key or regular rectifier diode, that's going to drop more or less. I recommend starting at the lowest drop and then working up as needed. A lot of times you run into this with like old LCD displays and that type of thing. So what we're just doing there is dropping the entire threshold down on these devices anyway, if it's not like a regulated set threshold. Um, newer devices you don't have this much of a problem with, but then it lets our 3.3 volt, 3 .3 volt trigger it just fine. We also have what are called five volt tolerant inputs. Now, when you're running five volts into 3.3 volts, we know we can't do that because it's going to exceed, or the output signal is going to exceed the maximum input signal of 3.6 volts and then blow your input out. But occasionally on these 3.3 volt pins, they are what's called five volt tolerant. So it'll take that signal right here, which is usually the danger zone, and then it adds a little headroom up top. So when you have that signal coming in that would usually pop us over 3.6 volts, it's just fine. 
And that's extremely convenient if you're trying to interface older 5 volt logic devices with newer 3.3 volt or even lower logic devices. But our Duo doesn't have that. So we have to depend on... So what you can do is use what's called a shifter. There's a bunch of different ways you can shift it, but the basic principle is the same for all of them. So let's say we have our five volt signal coming out and we run and run it into a 3.3 volt input. Then we just stick this device that's called a shifter in the middle of there that takes all of those levels and it translates it down to 3.3 volts and we're cool. Conversely, if you have a 3.3 volt signal that you're trying to send out and you're worried that it's not going to toggle your five volt, then you can use a shifter that's the other way or a uh, bi-directional shifter that'll do either way. And that's gonna boost that level up. So then you're okay with your five volt in. So let's talk a little bit about how this relates to our ramps MOSFETs. This is the schematic symbol for an N-channel uh, enhancement mode MOSFET. They're a happy little fat right there. And what's going to go on here is we're feeding a signal into that uh, that's a 5-volt signal. That's from our, our Arduino, just from our, our uh, MOSFET gate pin turning on and off. Now, uh, th technically, the MOSFETs that are on the ramps board are 10-volt logic, but they kind of work at 5-volt logic. We know not very well because they're poorly specced, but that's beside the point. Now, what that's doing is it's acting as a gate for the current that's going to flow from your V-plus through your heat bed and then heat that up. Uh, as it's traveling on its way to ground. And FETs have a parameter called uh, RDS, which is the resistance from your drain to your source. And as we know from Ohm's law, if you're trying to suck a set amount of current for something and you raise the resistance, you're also going to raise the, the dissipation, the wattage, so you're, you're kicking off more heat. And as your gate voltage goes up, your RDS goes down to, uh, to a certain extent. I'll draw a little chart here and show you what's going on. Here's our happy little chart, and we're going to plot voltage uh, on the gate against uh, resistance drain to source. So I'll just arbitrarily label these 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 volts. And that's your logic voltage coming into the gate. It's right below the chart there. And then we're talking about RDS. I'm just going to arbitrarily number those like 1 ohm, 2 ohm, 3 ohm, 4 ohm, 5 ohm. So if our FET is expecting at the top a 5-volt signal right here, then we're going to be placed right here on the chart at 5 volts if you're just looking vertically from, from our chart down. And then anything below that is going to be up in that other region. So if we plot that curve of the actual device, anything on the left there is going to be no-go and anything on the right is going to be okay. So if we're talking about 3 volts as opposed to 5 volts, just follow that up and then you can see if your FET is okay. So at five, we see that we have two ohms. At three, on this chart anyway, we have three. But what happens if this is, device is not um, rated for 3.3 volts? It's gonna go up there off the chart somewhere. And as they used to say back in the cartographer days, well, there be dragons. Because we just don't know, it's, it's off the charts. You can take it out and test it, but most likely your RDS is gonna be so high that when you suck that current through, you're gonna be overheating your MOSFET. We know that does happen. It's a classic problem on the ramps boards, and it's even worse because we were dealing with uh, 5 volts on a 10 volt MOSFET. Now we're dealing with 3.3 volts on a 10 volt MOSFET, and it's going to be even worse. So what's happening when we plug in an external MOSFET? Well, let's show our board MOSFET now real quick. We'll just draw that on there. And we're running this right through. Here's the connector from our V+. -plus. And then that's uh, ideally going to go to your bed or your hot end or whatever. But your bed is going to be between like one and like five ohms or something like that, depending on if it's 12 or 24 volts and et cetera, et cetera. And it's that resistance, according to Ohm's law, that's going to determine how much heat our MOSFET is going to be trying to dissipate as it's feeding voltage to your bed. It's just acting as a switch which means it's on when it's high and it's off when it's low. And then we kind of modulate the current also through duty cycle, which is just the ratio of high to low. And that's a whole different ball of wax. But when we plug instead into an external MOSFET instead of our bed MOSFET, what we're doing is we're letting an external MOSFET dissipate all the load, which is nice because they usually uh, uh, beef your MOSFET with a nice big fat heat sink and it can handle it. Under these conditions, our actual MOSFET that's sitting on the board is only acting as a switch 
for the MOSFET that's sitting off the board, our external MOSFET, which is in turn acting as a switch for the bed. So instead of running through one to five ohms, you're running through, you know, a kill ohm, like thousands of ohms. So our actual board MOSFET on our ramps is going to be dissipating way less heat and offloading all of that burden to the bed MOSFET. That means we're dissipating happy levels of heat and everything is cool. But that only applies if our logic signal that we're feeding to our ramp's board MOSFET is sufficient to make it act as a switch to turn it on and off the signal to the external MOSFET. So as long as it'll react to your voltage level, i.e. 5 volts, then you'll be cool because you'll be sending that level out to the bed MOSFET. But if it's not happy with 3.3 volts, then you're not going to be turning that MOSFET on and off. You're not going to be getting that signal to the bed MOSFET, and then it doesn't work. So in this instance, that has nothing to do with the actual heat that's being dissipated by the MOSFET on the ramps, and it has everything to do that the gate voltage required, here's our little, you know, our signal remember of our, our high and our low triggers, that, that's not as that's like a sliding scale for MOSFETs. It doesn't really apply, but just for illustration purposes, you're not turning the MOSFET on enough to get uh, sufficient current to give you a signal to your external MOSFET bed for your bed, and it's just not going to work. And I don't know how rare those conditions are with particular MOSFETs around the boards, but as you've seen in some of my other ones, there are ones with particularly bad specs, and there are ones that are counterfeit, and I have found a few that just won't turn on at all at 3.3 volts. However, if I can get another big shiny but... There's actually really no reason that you have to use the RAM's board MOSFET to turn on your external MOSFET at all. They just configured the input of that circuit to handle the voltage that's coming from the MOSFET when you place that board MOSFET instead of your bed on the external connectors. In fact, some of these boards actually have a signal input pin in, and a bed input pin so you can choose, and the ones that don't, like this one that I bought, you can easily modify just one resistor to make sure that you're feeding enough current to your LED that it's going to turn your opto isolator circuit on and off, but limit it so that it's not drawing enough current to mess up your uh, microcontroller pin. And you don't have to touch your board MOSFET at all. Now, this video has run like 12 minutes already. I was trying to keep it down under 10. That mod is going to take at least a 10 minute video to explain. So I'm going to have to put that in a separate video, but I will include it. It's going in the pile of the bajillions of videos that I have to finish up and get edited and post for all of you lovely people. So if that's something you're interested in, as opposed to messing around with the MOSFETs that are on your board, stay tuned to this channel for that, and I'll try to get it out as soon as I can. And not to sound needy, but I am just a humble maker, musician, and audio engineer. I can put out theory videos all day long with no additional cost to me because that just comes out of the old nugget. But if you like these in-depth hardware videos, and especially the ones where I need to actually purchase boards and modify them to get them to work, maybe multiple boards because I'll probably blow some up, then please check out my support links in the video description below. This Dua series was made possible by my Patreon supporters and by Karsten, who's a subscriber of mine who contributed money to actually let me buy the parts that I, you know, tore apart in this video for all of you, so you can thank him as well. And until I can purchase parts on Goodwill, I'm going to have to give these manufacturers actual dollars for their goods. Can you believe that? The nerve.